Hi there Flagstaff owners. Today in your 2018 Forest River Flagstaff V-Lite, we're going to be taking a look at and showing you how to install Lippert's ground control system. All right, so now that we've got everything plugged in, the first thing you probably did was probably hit that auto level button and you probably got a bunch of error messages and that's normal. The system needs to be homed so it knows its positioning on the jacks before it's going to operate. So to home it, which is a little strange in the instructions, they don't tell you to the kind of in the troubleshooting section. We want to go down to manual mode first and press enter. We then want to lower down our jacks. After you're in manual mode, you'll then need to choose either plus or minus, which is going to be either lowering or raising. And at that point, we are going to go ahead and hit the plus and operate the front. That'll drop down our front jacks. We want to make sure they're dropped down about six inches. We also want to drop down the rear jacks. Same, we want to go about six inches. It has to have a six inch retract procedure in order to home itself. So we've operated both of our jacks and brought them down. You can then just go to done, then head down to auto retract, press enter. It will now automatically retract all of your jacks. At this point, as long as you've lowered them down at least six inches, during the retract procedure, it's going to home itself and we should be operational at that point. Any error messages you got saying that you had an error with your jack, because that's typically what you see when you first fire it up. It's gonna say tongue jack failure. Each jack is gonna say that it's a failure because it hasn't been homed. So at this point, we should no longer have any, uh, any issues. It is gonna go through its full auto retract, so the tongue jack's gonna lower. It does take the procedure a little bit to, to operate, but it, I do like on the screen, it actually tells you which jack it's operating. So you can see right on the screen and know what, uh, step in the procedure that it's going through and it'll, it'll let you know once it's completed and return back to the screen just like this so now that we know we are fully retracted we're good to go so let's go ahead and uh auto level at this point so i'm going to go ahead and hit the button and then we'll see that each of them operate all right it says it started the auto leveling procedure so it's just going to go through its uh, steps. It's gonna talk about it there. We can go ahead and take a look at the jacks and watch it level it out. All right, the auto level procedure is complete and we are all looking good here. Our trailer has leveled out and this little guy right here also kind of operates as like a little bubble level, a little blink in the direction, letting you know that something's not level in that direction, but we are nice and centered. So yeah, we're all good at this point. Uh, at this point, we're ready to just enjoy our level camper or, uh, or if you're done testing it and you're ready to hit a campsite, just make sure you retract all your jacks. You can use the auto retract feature to do so, hook up and hit the road. To begin our installation, the first thing you'll want to do, and you'll want to do this before you even order your system, to determine if it's even going to fit on your trailer, and also to determine if there are things that you can relocate to make it fit, which is something we're going to have to do on this trailer, and that's pretty much the case with this system, pretty much on most trailers. They pretty much, for the most part, they don't fit on any trailer just by sticking it up there. You often have to relocate things. There's usually lines that run underneath that we're going to have to relocate and sometimes there's major components that we might need to adjust as well. So in this particular trailer, it's not gonna fit on this trailer because of the steps that are located here. They were in the way of allowing it to fit, but you can get different steps that don't utilize the underslung style that come out from the inside. So we're able to eliminate those steps by changing those over, allowing the system to now fit. We're checking the departure angle first because when you install your system for the rear, it needs to be within 18, and 48 inches from the leaf spring, or leaf spring hanger located there. And when we measure that, you can also do from the, the tire, the rear of the tire is also very close because the type of suspension system we've got on here actually doesn't have leaf springs. So 
Um, so you can use the, the edge of the tire. That typically would be where your leaf spring stack is. So you measure from there, you go back 18. I went ahead and marked that on the frame there, and then I also marked it at 48. That's our usable distance. We can put it anywhere between four, that 18 and that 48 inch mark. But we have to check our departure angle, and that's what this other line here is doing. We just got a heavy, a heavy object sitting there in front of the tire to hold. A, you can use a string or anything. We're using a tape measure. But we need to check the angle from the bottom of the tire to the back of the frame on the vehicle. And that angle there is going to let us know the clearance that we've got to the ground as the, as the trailer pivots on the wheels. We don't want our legs to be able to get ripped off by touching the ground before something else on the trailer was supposed to uh, potentially contact. So the systems that we're going to be installing will hang down about nine and a half inches. So while you've got that string in place, make sure you're holding it up to the back of the trailer there. And then just check along the bottom of the frame here where that nine and a half inches crosses the line. And it's roughly at about this point here where they cross. So we were not going to be able to install it any further rearward than that point because we're going to have contact with the ground potentially under certain situations. So I've gone ahead and marked um, those locations so I know where we're going to install it. We do have a, pl a place that we're able to put ours within that distance, that usable distance. You do want to check, so we took the steps completely out. On the other side of the vehicle, there is the uh, pipes to empty out your black water and gray water, and those are preventing us from installing it closer to the tire. Because uh, we could potentially have installed it here. There's no, nothing in this location on this side, but over on the other side, there is something. So that's why we had to make a choice. You either have to move the drain pipes or the steps, because those are in our usable area. So the steps is what we decided to get rid of, and we're going to be installing it here. You're going to perform the same checks at the front of the vehicle, or the front of your trailer. I've already got that one installed. We'll go up there and we'll show you what to look for there as well. But this way you can see what it's going to look like uh, with one of them installed up there. So here we are now at the front. I've went ahead and put the front one on. They install exactly the same, so we're going to be showing you how to put the rear one on. The only difference between the front and the rear one is the locations are slightly different. So the rear ones had to be between 18 and 48 inches behind the tire. The front one here needs to, it can go anywhere from the very front of the frame of your trailer, and that's not the A-frame, we're talking about the actual like I-beam frame, so from the front of that I-beam up to 60 inches back, which I've gone ahead and marked there. Anywhere in there is a usable range that you can install this in, but it does still have that same restriction of ground clearance, so you're going to do the same thing by placing a string at the front of the front tire there at the ground. We're going to check the angle up to the front of the trailer and make sure that we never cross that departure line. Nine and a half inches is roughly what you see here. It is actually a little bit shorter than nine and a half. It's about nine and a quarter, but I recommend making sure you're checking with nine and a half to ensure that you do have the appropriate clearance once you've chosen your place to put it. And this location that we've chosen here will clear our departure plenty. We can see we're almost even with where the A-frame is there, so we don't have to worry about departure here where it should be okay to go. So now that we've determined the usable locations, the only other thing that you really want to check before we, you know, you go ahead and start ordering it and start making the modifications we're going to be doing here is double check the cross distance here. Make sure there's nothing in the way. Now, normally you'll find like propane lines. We actually got a propane line right here. So we, we did actually have to take it loose, we, but we're able to just kind of position it back a little bit and we'll just re-secure it right where it's at. But check all those things because all the stuff underneath running across, we have some uh, there's like a cross support brace that goes there. All that stuff has to have proper clearance for it to install. Once you've got all your checks done, let's go ahead and start getting it on. We're going to head back to the rear and we'll show you how to get that one mounted up. All right, so now that we know the locations that's going to be acceptable to install it in, we're going to go ahead and start putting our parts on. One of the things that I like to do is after I kind of determine where I want to put it, I want to make sure that when I put this side on, the other side is going to be exactly in the same distance, so it's straight across. So I plan on putting it, you know, roughly in this position here. We checked the departure, this was all good. So then to figure out exactly where we're gonna put it, I measured from the back of the I-beam here up to the front until I determined that was gonna be a good spot. And I actually started on the other side and did that because the drain pipes on the other side that are in the way are roughly in this further up area. So we went ahead and came over on this side, measured up 82 inches and put our mark there. That way we know when we put the front edge of our piece here, it's gonna be the same on each side. And your measurement may not be 82 inches. You want to make sure you're doing your own where it's going to fit on your trailer. So now we're going to hold up the bracket that our uh, lifts install on. The square slots and square holes there are going to go up against the bottom of the I-beam. 
and we'll be drilling through the I-beam to secure it, and we'll use carriage bolts to secure it. This is the orientation it's gonna sit in, so these guys here are gonna hang down like that. And if you look right here, this piece, right where these pieces that hang down are, they actually stick up just a little bit right there and make a lip. That lip needs to butt up against the I-beam like that. So we're gonna line it up with the mark that we made there. Go ahead and clamp it into place. We're gonna put a clamp on the other side as well. Make sure that it is all the way in against that frame. And as long as we're lined up good and fully in, we can head underneath to start drilling it out. Now when you're putting your clamps in place, there are gonna be some holes underneath. You're gonna have a single hole and behind it a slotted hole. Those are the access holes that we're gonna stick our drill bit up through to drill out for the square hole. So make sure your clamps aren't blocking those. Once you've got that clamped up there, we're gonna grab a 5 16 drill bit and drill them out. So now we're gonna go ahead and go up to the bottom and drill those out. I like to start with the outside ones first, um, just to make it easier. But what I am gonna do before I drill out the inside ones, the underbelly that's located right here, you do wanna pull that back and just double check that as well, because before you drill any holes, the, the best thing to do is make sure everything's gonna fit where you want it. So I am gonna peel this back real quick, just double check myself before I drill the holes and then we'll drill them out. But one of the small nuances about this trailer that's different than the others that makes it more difficult to install is your underbelly here isn't just normally secured with uh, fasteners. It actually has a lip that runs along the inside of the I-beam and you're gonna have to drill through that lip as well as the I-beam and slide your bolts in there and try to get it all to work. It is a very difficult, uh, just difficult to get your hands in there to install it on this particular trailer because of the way they've designed the underbelly. So we do gotta get the underbelly out of the way and then we can start drilling. All right, so we got that underbelly pulled back and we actually got kind of lucky that those brackets for holding the underbelly in, they stop right before there's a cross beam here in the middle and it's gonna clear where our bolts go. So that's gonna work out nicely for us here. So now we got our 5 16 drill bit. We verified that we can see on the other side to know that we're not gonna damage anything. Now we'll just drill it on out through. I'm gonna use a little bit of silicone spray. They make better, um, Better stuff than that, but uh, a little bit of lubricant really helps the drill drill a little bit easier. And then we're gonna go up to the bottom and drill it out. After you've got it drilled out, we're gonna feed our hardware in place. So this is our carriage bolt. We're gonna be feeding it up through the bottom to where it goes up like this. The square head there on the carriage bolt will fit into the square slot that we just drilled through. That'll prevent the bolt from spinning so that way we can tighten the nut down which is the wrench on the other side. You may need to keep a little pressure upward on it to keep the square in the hole. So we're just gonna feed it up and then get our nut on there and snug it down and then we can repeat this process for the remaining holes. I do like to do them one at a time. That way it prevents, uh, in case our clamps shimmy around a little bit when we're drilling from all the vibrations, it'll help ensure that everything stays exactly how we got it here. So we'll go up through there. Our nut will go on top. And then snug it down. I'm keeping an eye on the side of it here, just making sure that the square is staying in the square hole, that it's lined up properly. If you've got it twisted in there and it's not lined up with the slots, it may still grab, but when you tighten it down, you're not really pulling it into the hole properly allowing the head of that carriage bolt to do its job. So we are sliding up into the square very nicely and the round head of that carriage bolt is seating flush onto the metal. And these don't tighten that tight, so just get it snug from here for here. That'll be good enough to ensure that this isn't gonna go anywhere. And then just rinse and repeat for the remaining holes. When you go to drill out the inside ones, it is a little bit slotted because there's various thicknesses of I-beam Ideally, on that slot, you'll want to be right in the center, but you can move it forward or backward slightly uh, to adjust for the thickness of your I-beam. Once I get both the outside bolts done and snug down, then I'll go back and do the inside. I'll probably drill both of these holes and then put the hardware in, because the outside one should be good enough to hold it in place. Make sure you're picking an appropriate spot in that slot that's going to line up on your I-beam for you, and then just drill it on out.
we're gonna get our cross brace started. This is pieces of your cross brace. We want the end here that has the big slots and the square holes. The big slots are gonna fit over these ears that are sticking up right there. So just slide that guy right up on top. And it's just gonna kinda hang, hang down off of there like that. That's fine, I mean, it might wanna slide off of there. We're gonna be bolting it in place, but that's how it's gonna sit. We'll then take our carriage bolts here. They're gonna drop down through the square hole that's located in there. And then that'll drop down through the single hole that's located there. We'll now put a nut on it. And if you kind of give this a twist to the one side, that'll help prevent the bolt from wanting to push back up into the hole while you're getting the nut on it. And I just tighten it down until it's about flush with the bottom. And that's about as far as we want to go because we need this to actually hang down and be loose because we have a piece that we're going to be sliding into here and we have identical components we're going to put on the other side that's going to attach those together and we need that movement for it all to kind of line up properly. So we're just going to get these loosely installed on here. Sometimes the powder coating they put on there gets a little thick so you might have to work it in a little bit. There we go. Same thing on this one, if you put a little bit of side pressure on it, you can help keep it from pushing back up. And that's about as far as we want to go there. So now at this point, we're going to repeat all the steps that we did on this side to get this bracket and our cross tube here installed over on the other side. Um, again, I recommend measuring from this point here to or, or the back here to the rear of the trailer and making sure that those measurements are going to be the same on the one you're putting on the other side so it goes straight across. So now we're over here on the opposite side. There's the mark that I made so that way I know it's going to line up with the other side. We're going to get it butted up there, clamped on the same way, and then drill out the holes and secure it with the same hardware that we used on the other side. All right, we got the other side completed there. You can see that we've got them hanging down. This piece here, just the bar with a hole in the center of it there, this is the center piece to our cross brace. We're gonna slide this inside of one of the tubes that we installed. Doesn't matter which one, just pick one. That's why we wanted it loose so we could have that downward angle. And then we can kind of just lift up on each one and slide it together. The hole that's there in the brace is at the center point. So we wanna to try to center that between the two braces. So I just grab my paint stick and my marker here. And now we've got it slid into each side. We'll measure the distance across. So we're at about 17, a little over 17 and a half. 17 and a half will be close enough. So we're just going to uh, make sure that our hole's at half of that. So it's about, roughly nine inches, a little under nine inches. We'll do like nine and three quarters, probably gonna be pretty close to that center point. So we'll just adjust it until we get our center hole to about eight and three quarters. So we'll adjust it till we get to that eight and three quarters mark. That's pretty close right there. Yeah, we're right there at about that mark that's that'll put us roughly centered between our two pieces there I like to then take my paint stick and just put a mark there on each side and I'll do it on the other side too this way I just know if my bars slid in and out I should expect to see a little bit of yellow on each side if I see yellow only on one side you'll probably see it slid in or just gotta let you know that you've moved so now we've got everything marked out there you have a hole here and here in each one of these braces, so on this side we do here as well. We're gonna drill that out with a 3 8 drill bit. And you can drill through this and drill straight, stri uh, straight through it, because we're gonna need to drill out the other side as well. There's a hole on, these, on this side. But I recommend just drilling out this hole, then going over to the other side and drilling out that hole and doing it that way. Because if you go straight through, you can angle it and you might not come out where you think you're gonna come out. So we got our 3 8 drill bit here. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and drill those on out. And I'll use my knees as a brace, kind of like that. And actually, I think what we're gonna do before we drill it, we're gonna snug this down, because there's a little bit more movement there than I would like when trying to drill. So we'll snug these down real quick with our wrench and then go back and do the drilling.
hole it should be easier to drill now and then we'll drill it out After I drill it out, I do like to take my legs underneath, just push up a little bit. Just wallows the hole just a little bit to make it easier for us to pass our bolt straight through. And we're gonna repeat that now for the hole on the other side and we can get a bolt pass through it and we'll repeat for each of the remaining ones. So now we're gonna take the long bolts that come in our kit. You can see it's plenty long to pass through the bar. Go ahead and slide that in there. Might have to push up or down just a little bit on it to get it to go through and secure it with a nut. We want to leave it loose so that way we can do that same thing, kind of push it up and down as we need to to get our hardware installed. So we'll just bring it down until it's close and that'll be fine right there. We'll still be able to move it. That'll help support it and we're just going to move on down. The next hole's here just above this uh, little cross brace that's on it. So we're going to drill out each side of that one, then head over to this tube and do the same thing, passing our bolts through. So now we can go back and torque all of our hardware. You'll use a half inch socket for all of your carriage bolts. For these ones, you will need a, probably to have a wrench on the other side to hold it to prevent it from spinning. Once we've got all our hardware torqued down, we can grab our jacks now and they'll install into the brackets here that we've just put in place. Now there's a couple of different ways you can get your jack up here. Um, we've got an assistant here with us in the shop, so we're going to be using our assistant. But if you're trying to do this all by yourself at home, um, you could take your jack and put it onto like a floor jack and use that to jack it up until it butts up against the bottom. And then you can just make sure it's loose enough where you can kind of shimmy it around and line up your bolts and you should be okay there. Before we lift it up though, we're gonna take our bolts. I, I find it easier, if you're using a, if you're doing it with a buddy, I find it easier to have the hardware already in there. If you're doing it by yourself, then it's probably be easier to get the jack lifted up and get the component in place first and then drop your hardware down. So we're gonna drop down our bolts here in the back. These are the uh, shorter hex head bolts that come in your kit. We're gonna drop two down in the flanges there. And then over here on the bracket that we installed on the I-beam, you're gonna have long slotted holes towards the inside. And then towards the outside of the frame, you actually have six holes across here. Four of those holes are small slotted holes and two are round. We want the small slotted holes. That's where we're gonna drop our bolts down. So just kind of reach up in there and drop your bolt down until it falls through there. All right, now that we got all our hardware in, that's a good time to grab our grab an extra set of hands here to help us lift it up. And our goal is to get a nut onto one of each of these, and then at least one of these two outer ones on each side there, and that way it'll hold itself up. Lifting up on the outside, we're gonna line it up with our bolts here on the inside. And then I'm gonna get a nut started on each of these. Okay, got that one started. There we go. We've got them both started here on the outside. Once we get them all started on this side, we can go ahead and snug them down and then we're gonna repeat this over on the other side the same way to get that one installed. All right, so now we're gonna go back with a 9 16th socket and wrench to snug down our hardware. Now, once you get it close drawn up here in the back, I recommend stopping, because these are slotted, and that way we can kind of line it up. I'd like to try and line it up as best I can with the flange. We can go back and torque our hardware to the specifications outlined in our instructions. 
got this one installed. We're going to go up into the front and we're going to install that one. It installs the same way. We already discussed on determining the location for it, where you're going to position it. But as far as how you're going to install the brackets and stuff, it's the exact same parts. So we've got both of the jacks underneath installed. Now we got to get the one here at the front, our tongue jack. So this is pretty simple to actually remove. It's only got a single wire on the original one, and that's how most of them are, unless you have one like we're installing, which does more features than this. Uh, but it's just these three bolts. You got your foot down here at the bottom. We're gonna take the foot off of there because the jack's gonna slide up this direction. So the base here on the foot is gonna be too wide to slide out. So remove the pin and clip from it, and then we can just take those and set those aside. And now we're just going to zip these out and then we'll just set it off to the side um, and reconnect our wire in a little bit. I already pulled the fuse for the jack so that way there's no power going up here. So if we wanted to, we could cut the wire right here close to it and get it away because the, the fuse has been pulled. Uh, but let's get those out and we'll get it set off to the side. So there's just the three bolts. We're going to use a 916 socket. And this thing here, I think yeah, it'll rotate if they have one of those on there. And we're just gonna zip these out of here. I recommend saving them, but you do get new ones for your new jack. All right, we'll get our hardware set out of the way. And then let's take a look here, see what our wire length looks like. All right, after assessing the wire length here, I did originally want to just pull it up, but I don't think we're going to have enough length. We'll try here real quick and see, but I think we're going to have to cut the wire first. Yeah, before we'll have enough length. So we'll go ahead and grab our cutters here and just snip the wire. If you follow your jack wire down, there's typically an inline fuse in it, and we had an inline fuse in ours right there, so we pulled the fuse out. We're just going to cut it on this side of the fuse, right over here on this side, because we know with the fuse out of it, there's no current, that way this wire won't be live. So we'll just cut it here. I like to leave enough length if they want to repurpose this fuse and wire, they can do so. So there we go, we got that cut. Just pull that down. And if you wanted to, you could also unhook it from the source. It probably goes to a ring terminal, to a circuit breaker or disconnect switch or something like that. But we're gonna hook our new jack main power directly to the battery as it has its own inline fuse as well. So now we've got that out of the way, all we gotta do now is just grab our new jack and slide it on down in there. So here's our new jack. Simply just drop down in there. Being careful not to pinch any, any wires or anything like that when you're dropping it down in there. There we go. And it lines up right where our old jack was because it is a very similar jack. This one just has some additional features. So our old jack just had the single wire here with the inline fuse. You can see this one's going to tap into the leveling system so that way it can communicate and operate with those systems during automatic operation. So now we're just going to grab our bolts and drop them down in there. These are going to be the new bolts, not the ones that we took out. They're very similar. They probably are the exact same bolt that, uh, since they're from the same company. So just get those started. I like to make sure I get them started by hand before I put a tool on them. I also like to make sure that I get all three of them started before I put any tools on them. Because if you tighten down two of them that you got started, that third one probably isn't going to line up that nice and it's going to be difficult to install. All right, we got each one started by hand. I'll we'll just run them down. Now we'll go ahead and put our foot back in place. This is a new one that came with our jack. Just double checking to make sure if there's any grooves that we line those up. And there's a groove on the other side there, although I don't see one here on the pet on the foot. There we go. Probably just a little, little bit of the coating on it that was preventing it from sliding on there. Our foot will slide on. You'll line up the hole, reinsert the pin and clip. And at that point now, we just need to wire up our wires. And we're gonna be routing all of our wires and getting everything installed here shortly. So I'm gonna route all the wires to where they need to go and then we'll show you how, where and how each one hooks up. All right, we got all our jacks mounted up. So there's only a few smaller pieces left that we need to mount before we can start wiring everything up. We have two panels we'll need to mount. This is the interior one. 
It's going to be a touchscreen. It's larger. You also have an exterior one that's just going to have buttons on it. They both mount up fairly similarly. And then we also have two sensors that we need to mount underneath as well for the leveling sensors. And then everything wires up. So we're going to show you how to mount this guy here. This panel actually has a bracket that you install first. The other panel just has the screw holes. Um, the mounting is made right into the exterior panel. But the interior one here has a bracket that's behind it that you'll use. So we went ahead and chose to put it in this location here. We chose this location because we had easy access to be able to get our wiring routed through the floor there. So we took this little panel off just so we could assess what's behind this. Because before you go to drill out any holes and stuff, first thing we want to know is, hey, am I going to cut into something? So reach up in there, make sure everything's good there. And then it also worked out nicely because we can get our wiring here. So that's why we chose this location. Another reason why I like this location too is because uh, this is the door to leave right here. So that way, if you wanted to watch it level or anything, you could reach in, touch the panel, and be outside, watch it level, check to make sure everything's working fine. So I went ahead and mounted up the ring. Just set it in place and run your screws in. These come with your kit. You'll need a, just a Phillips bit to run them in place. And then after I do that, I'm gonna, I went ahead and marked the inside because I may or may not want to take the plate off when I go to cut it. It just depends on how the material here feels. If it's soft enough, we'll leave it in place and we'll be able to cut it with our jigsaw without having to remove the panel. But if it wants to hang up on the material and it's a little bit um, more difficult to cut, we'll have to pull this panel off so we don't damage it. But anyway, I marked out the inside. We got it mounted up. Make sure it's nice and level and it's where you want it. After that, we're going to take our bit here and we're going to drill out each corner. The main reason I like mounting the panel like this too first before uh, mounting the bracket before drilling and all that is you can see how close the screw hole is to where we need to actually make our cut and it's really easy if you were to cut this without this piece up here to cut it slightly too wide and then your screws not really grabbing anything but yeah we got that going so now we're just gonna stick our blade in here and trim out this interior piece All right, now that we've got that cut out, we'll test the fit of our panel. Um, there is a good chance in a couple of spots like this we're gonna have to clean it up. Let's just see. So yeah, we gotta clean it up just a little bit. And what I actually recommend for cleaning this up, we're just gonna go grab a, a file and that way we can file the edges down until they're smooth with our bracket. And that is a nice fit. It fits in snugly. It should push into place, then drop down. And then we can put our screws in the bottom. Now, before we do that, of course, it's gonna be pretty hard to get to the wiring. So we're gonna hook up our wiring. On the back of this panel, we'll go ahead and show you that now. We're gonna show, be showing you the wiring here shortly. So we'll just cover this one. There are three plugs in the bottom of this panel. One of those plugs, we'll get your CAN bus wire, and that's this gray harness that comes in your kit. And that's going to be these two. They actually have two connectors that look like this. So you can plug this into either one. It doesn't matter which one we plug it into. We're going to plug it into one of them. And it plugs in with the release tab towards the screen. Now the one next to it that has the same type of connector in, that actually is going to get a terminating resistor. You'll get two of these in your kit. These terminating resistors here, they, it's just a resistor with the exact same type of connector in for your CAN bus. This has to be present for CAN communication to occur, so go ahead and slide that in there. Now, we are going to be routing these out this panel, so I'm just showing you that there. Um, and the last, we got our power wire. Now, when you get your power wire in your kit, you can see here it's just going to be this connector that will plug into our unit. You get a black and a red wire out of it. That's it. You only get about six inches of wire there. So you'll have to make your own harness and run this up to the battery to get your power and ground. So we're just using some uh, four pole wiring that we had laying around here. This actually routes up and we don't go directly to the battery. We actually go to a circuit breaker first to ensure we have proper circuit protection and then the circuit breaker will then go to the battery. So this is routed down through that opening along with our CAN bus wire down to the opening where we can route them 
up to where we're going to be mounting the where we're going to be hooking up the rest of our components and where our battery is. So I'm going to go ahead and route these up here, push them through the back side, and then we'll plug them in. And the little terminating resistor, you can have that already in there. It doesn't really matter about that guy. All right. So now we've got those pulled through. We're just gonna plug them into the unit here and then we'll drop the unit in and secure it. Now I've already, I do already have these hooked to a circuit breaker in the battery. So if you do as well, you should see that power up just like that. goes in there like that and then there are two little tiny screws there's some small holes in the bottom these will screw straight up to the bottom into your bracket and you don't want to go too tight with them they're very small screws and when you're using these smaller hardware here it can be easy to strip it out and you don't want to do that with your one touch panel here because this device actually can integrate with other Lippert components and can be used to control them as well. So this is something you might actually be wanting to get back to access again at another point. Once you get your interior one mounted, we can mount the exterior one here. This can go pretty much wherever you'd like as long as the cable cables are going to reach. Typically it's mounted fairly close to the main unit and on the outside on one of these lower panels or inside of a compartment door is another good spot. If you can mount it in a compartment door, if you have something like that here at the front, I recommend it that way. Nobody can come over and just touch your buttons. But uh, if you don't have that, this is a good spot to mount it down here. You do get some varying fasteners in your kit. So these are the self-tapping variant that it came with. And just like inside, we just kind of held it up here. We marked out the hole we needed to cut, Use the same technique to cut out the hole, slid this in here and just screwed it in. This one has a much bigger uh, kind of gap around the hole you got to cut. So it's a lot easier to give plenty of meat for each of those screws when cutting out this hole. We're now at the rear of our trailer and we're going to mount up the leveling sensor. We've already got it mounted here because it's actually really simple to mount it up. This is the bracket for your leveling sensor. It's just a flat piece of metal with four holes in it. The holes that are closest to the edge of the metal are the mounting holes for mounting the bracket to your trailer and the two holes that are further away with the rounded corners here, those are for mounting the sensor onto it. And they just use self-tapping screws. The sensor will just simply sit right here on top and the holes in the sensor line up with the holes in the bracket. So just run your self-tapping screws through there right into the sensor. It is plastic, so don't tighten these down too tight. It just needs to be secure enough to hold the sensor in place. Now the sensor does have a, a particular direction it wants to face. So make sure on top of the sensor, it's labeled front and rear. You've got front facing towards the front and rear facing towards the rear. Another visual cue to know that you've done it right since you can't see the top of it once you mount it is the wires that are coming out of it there. The wires come out of the side labeled front. When mounting this up, you will probably have to cut out some of your underbelly to expose a cross tube, something that you have that you can securely mount the sensor to. It does need to be securely mounted. And then you'll want to center it on your trailer. You can see I made some small marks there to know where the center was. And then I mounted it up right in the center. You ideally want your rear sensor to be as far rear as possible and your front sensor when you mount it to be as far front as possible. But they both mount basically the same way. Uh, they, they look identical. You can actually swap the two. Just make sure that you've got uh, the correct wire plugged into the appropriate one because they do have the same connector ends as well. And your self-tapping screws, you'll use an eight millimeter socket to run those down. Once you've got everything done, you've tested out the system, you can come back with some expanding foam and seal this back up. All right, and the last major component we need to mount is the fuse operating unit here. And we decided to mount this underneath the sink and the interior. And the reason we did choose this location was because it needs to be close enough to the battery for our battery wires that hook up there on the top right to be able to reach the battery. And Typically, this is designed to be installed in like a front interior compartment, like a lower compartment. There's not one on this particular motorhome. In his lower compartment, he just has his propane tanks. There's no floor, which means it would be exposed to moisture. So that's why we went right here, just on the inside. The propane tanks are actually mounted right underneath here. So this is all exposed to the outside down here. So we just came right inside to keep it protected from moisture because that panel is not waterproof. 
you'll mount your panel up by just using four of the wood screws that come included with it and just run those into each corner to get it mounted up. After that, we've got all of our major components mounted up, so we just need to start hooking up all of our wiring. Now, one of the coolest part about this kit is that all the wiring has labels on it, and you can see there how it's labeled left rear, right rear, each one, left front, right front, all of those are gonna have labels, and we have labels here on the unit, right front. So make sure you're plugging that RF for right front into the right front there. And then this wire is gonna route outside back to the, or well, right up here to the right front jack. And each one is going to, again, be labeled. So just run each one as necessary. The connector ends are going to be the same on them, so you can mix them up. So it is important to look at those labels. Uh, but another thing that can help you to ensure that you're plugging them in right beyond the labels is that the length of each wire is going to be different because since it's designed to be mounted in a front compartment, your left rear and right rear are going to be significantly longer than your left front and right front wiring. Same with your sensor wires. Your front sensor harness is going to be shorter than the rear sensor harness. Um, but yeah, everything's labeled there. So the way we got all our wires out is we actually drilled a hole right down there. We use a two and a half inch hole saw to make a pretty substantial hole for all these wires. Everything routes out from there and then we'll connect it up. The only ones that really aren't labeled are going to be your two power and ground, which are kind of right there. They are somewhat labeled. It's just kind of hidden behind it. They're a little, just not as noticeably labeled as the other uh, harnesses. The other thing that's not too obvious is the can here. This is the one we plugged into that, uh, the one touch panel that we mounted up there. That's that gray harness. They're just called can. And same thing with the other one that gets the terminating resistor is also just called can. So just pay attention to those. Um, yeah, everything else is pretty straightforward. Our battery wires are gonna go out. We are gonna go to a circuit breaker before the battery. But if your battery is close enough to this panel, you don't really need to because as you can see this is a fuse panel so as long as it's close enough the only reason we put a circuit breaker in line with ours is because we do have a pretty substantial run up to the battery it's not it's not, it's not substantial but we do got to go probably about 10 feet uh, worth of wire which is further than i would like to go on circuit protected so we do put one close to the battery just to ensure that it is protected up to this point so we're now at the front of our trailer this is the circuit breaker i was talking about you can buy it here at e-trailer it doesn't come in the kit this is from buyers and it's 120 amp rated so it's got enough uh, potential there to be able to operate all the jacks potentially simultaneously the unit should never really operate each jack um, simultaneously but uh, we've got enough protection and available uh, current there to be able to provide it if it needed to so this uh, this line here going over goes up to where we just showed you that panel under the sink this is all the wiring all of it pretty much just came out here and we just start to disperse it from here going towards the back we use clamps where necessary to secure everything in place those don't come in the kit so if you need some you can get those here at each trailer as well as self-tapping screws um, the only other thing we needed to show you here's that wire that we routed for the one touch panel so since you have to run that yourself, that's just going to power and ground. And we ran that over here. The customer's battery disconnect switch is located here. So we put it on an existing circuit breaker on the other side of the disconnect switch. So that way the panel will power down when he, dis when he unpowers his uh, disconnect switch. When he turns it off, it everything powers down. The only thing that still will remain power will be our front jack, which we hook directly to the battery. So that way we can operate the tongue jack regardless of the battery disconnect switch. And here you can see our wiring routed back. It all starts at that front panel where the tanks are there, and then we just separate them out following the labels on the wires and route them to their appropriate spot and plug it into the connector ends. All the ends are going to be shaped in a certain way to where the, you can't really plug them in wrong because multiple, mo most of the components will have two connectors, like our jack has two connectors. But you can see here that uh, one is a triangle shape and the other one is a rectangle shape, so you can't plug them in incorrectly. And that completes our installation of Lippert's ground control on our 2018 Forest River Flagstaff V-Lite.